Hello everyone and welcome to today's audio log. My name is Researcher Fries and for today's document we will be reading SCP-770 Nuclear Slime. It has an object class of Keter and special containment procedures SCP-770 is to be stored in a 500 milliliter flask made of isotopically pure iron 56. The flask is to be elevated for atmosphere and stored in a depressurized steel safe lined with isopochly pure iron 56 foil and 7.5 centimeters of lead. Currently, SCP-770 is stored at... SCP-770 is to be given nutrients in the form of 20 milligrams of technetium 95 m gas produced by the research reactor at... These are to be administered twice a year. SCP-770 may be removed for research and experimentation, providing a detailed research plan is approved by a level 4 staff. All research staff must be qualified in dealing with radiological safety hazards. Research is to be carried out in an environmentally isolated laboratory, and research staff must use glove boxes or conventional biohazard suits. After SCP-770 has been returned to storage, the atmosphere of the laboratory must be purged, and any materials or instruments that have come into contact with SCP-770 are to be destroyed in a high temperature plasma arc furnace. Now for Addendum 770-1. Following Incident I-770-I, SCP-770 is not to be exposed to official also known as fertile super heavy elements, including any isotopes of uranium, plutonium, thorium, or mericinium. Permission to perform experiments using these elements will be immediately denied. Agent has been prohumously commended for his quick thinking in preventing a data expunged. And now for its description. SCP-770 is a strain of mold that is similar in appearance to the common slime mold. It is largely colorless and translucent in appearance, and will adhere to almost any surface. What sets SCP-770 apart is that it respires without oxidation by means of a poorly understood nuclear reaction. When present on a surface, SCP-770 will absorb any radioactive isotopes, or any isotopes larger in atomic mass than iron-56, with preference given to heavier isotopes. These isotopes will then undergo a nuclear reaction in which they are reduced to more stable isotopes and energy is released. The decay products of this reaction, normally lighter elements such as carbon, oxygen, or nitrogen, along with the energy produced, are used by SCP-770 as a source of sustenance so that it may grow and reproduce which it does by the periodic release of airborne spores. There is a strong possibility that the elements produced by SCP-770 will also be radioactive isotopes. During ingestion and reaction of isotopes, SCP-770 will emit significant quantities of ionizing radiation, including alpha, beta, gamma, neutrons, and hard x-rays. The radiation output is so substantive that an adult human would receive an LD50 level dose of radiation after approximately minutes of exposure to 50 mg of active SCP-770. The mold will also release copious amounts of heat and can achieve a surface temperature in excess of 1200 degrees centigrade. While doing this, it will appear to glow white hot. How SCP-770 is able to withstand this level of radiation and temperature without disintegration is unknown. Currently, the most feasible way to sterilize an area of SCP-770 is by means of specialized plasma arc furnaces that are designed to reach temperatures of 3000 degrees centigrade. Although incident I-770-1 demonstrated that thermite, when used in a confined area, can also be effective. Due to the relevant abundance of viable isotopes, the vast energy produced by nuclear reactions, and the propensity of neutron radiation to create more unstable isotopes, SCP-770 has an extreme capacity for growth. With adequate food supply, SCP-770 will produce spores approximately every hours and is capable of doubling in mass every 
hours, as no known herbivores or herbicidal diseases could survive exposure to the radiation produced by SCP-770, there is no limiting factor to the mold achieving a geometric growth rate. In the event of a containment breach or worth a data expunged event, projections indicate that the mold would spread quickly and the Earth's biosphere would be rendered uninhabitable after approximately months. Sterilization of affected areas via nuclear weapons may be a viable option. However, should SCP-770 survive the initial blast, the fallout would provide a dimensionally rich growth medium. And now finally, historical note. SCP-770 was recovered from a large series of deep caves beneath in the former Soviet Union in 1957. A lack of viable isotopes in the geological stratum that would have been uranium bearings implies that SCP-770 has been active in this cave system for a prolonged period of time, possibly up to years. Shock damage, partial vertification, and a buildup of radioactive gases in one of the caverns indicate that SCP-770 may have undergone a data expunged event at some point in the last years. A publicly mined mining industry broke into the cave system in 1957, resulting in the data expunged. Unfortunately, no spores of SCP-770 left the cave system, allowing the caverns to be purged when the incident was discovered by the Foundation. Estimates made after ascertaining SCP-770's growth rates project a breach of the cave system would have been possible after years, and had the mold not been brought to the Foundation's attention. And that is the end of the document of SCP-770, Nuclear Slime. Thank you guys so much for listening to today's audio log, and I hope to see you in the next one.